Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Japan Up Close webinar. Uh, our topic today is strength, Strengthening Japan ASEAN Relations Based on the Rule of Law. My name is Jonathan Sobel. I'm a partner at Creative Japan, which is a strategic communications company here in Tokyo, where I'm sitting. Uh, I'm also a former Tokyo bureau chief at the Financial Times. Uh, we are very lucky today to have two guests uh, with us, uh, although one of them is having a little technical uh, difficulty signing on from Thailand. So hopefully he will join us later. For now, I will introduce uh, the uh, guest who is here. That's uh, Lam Peng Er. He's a principal research fellow at the East Asian Institute of the National University of Singapore. And we're lucky to have caught him while he's passing through Tokyo. So he's just in another room. All right, uh, thank you. then those of you who are watching at home or in your offices will ask some questions. So I would invite you to submit questions to the Q&A function of this Zoom webinar. Uh, you can do so anytime between now and the end of the Q&A session. So initially I will turn things over uh, to Dr. Lam. Uh, I believe you have a presentation with some visuals. Uh, I'll turn it over to you for a few minutes uh, and uh, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's really uh, my privilege and honor to be here with you. And uh, without further ado, I'll share my screen with you. Yeah. Um, my presentation uh, comprises two parts. Uh, the first section examines the golden jubilee of the ASEAN-Japan partnership and the way forward for this cordial relationship. The second section is a short reflection on international law in regional governance. So next, on the Golden Jubilee, the 50th anniversary of the ASEAN-Japan partnership. You know, the conventional account is that the genesis of this partnership, the start of this partnership, was the deal-making in the Synthetic Rubber Forum in 1973. So I, I suppose if I were to mention the Synthetic Rubber Forum, many people would say, huh, what's that, right? So, and, and this is supposed to be like the starting point of this partnership. And this was a narrow economy issue pertinent to only a few natural rubber producing ASEAN countries then. ASEAN countries like uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. And this synthetic rubber forum, 1973, has, has now been forgotten by most people. Um, Japan in 1973 uh, had the technology and ability to produce synthetic rubber, and the natural rubber producing countries was, were, of course, very concerned. So there was a deal, uh, an agreement between the ASEAN countries and, and Japan uh, to deal with this uh, synthetic rubber, which impacted on them economically. Um, my interpretation is that the genuine golden jubilee of the Japan-ASEAN relations should be dated back to the 1977 Fukuda Doctrine. Not the 73 Synthetic Rubber Forum, but the 1977 Fukuda Doctrine. And uh, arguably, the Fukuda Doctrine is the blueprint, the roadmap of Japan's relations with Southeast Asia. It is a regional doctrine of Japan. Its uh, durability, is in part due to its resonance with the 10 ASEAN member states. In fact, when we talk about uh, strategic doctrines, most doctrines have disappeared, you know, but the Fukuda doctrine um, is, 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 is still here. People still talk about it, okay? And we are looking forward to uh, 2027 when Japan and the ASEAN states will celebrate the 50th anniversary of this relationship. So uh, I would argue that this doctrine would not have lasted if the ASEAN member states have rejected it. And uh, there's an irony to this. 
the Southeast Asian countries have embraced the Fukuda doctrine. And what is the irony? The irony is that the Fukuda doctrine is remembered more fondly in Southeast Asia than in Japan. Okay. Now, why are the three tenets of the Fukuda doctrine articulated by the then Japanese Prime Minister Fukuda Takio in 1977. Um, just, you know, a bit of history before this. Um, three years earlier, his predecessor, uh, Tanaka Kakwe, visited Southeast Asia, uh, visited Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, and Jakarta. And there were violent anti-Japanese demonstrations in Bangkok and in Jakarta. And that really shocked the Japanese uh, diplomatic and corporate communities. And uh, so before 1977, the Japanese government, uh, corporate leaders, you know, they put their brains together and asked, how can they significantly improve relations with Southeast Asia? Because that's the backdrop of uh, Imperial Japan's invasion and occupation of Southeast Asia, uh, 42 to 45. And then there's a perception, rightly or wrongly, that Japan was an economic predator. Okay, extracting resources from Southeast Asia, you know, and then exporting its manufactured products. You know? So there was a great deal of unhappiness in Southeast Asia. So the Fukuna Doctrine, 1977, was an attempt to significantly improve relations between Japan and Southeast Asia. So uh, one of the three tenets. The first tenet is that post-war Japan will not act as a military power in Southeast Asia. I think it will never again become a military, uh, a militaristic power to its, this region like its imperial predecessor, the uh, Samurai Japan, you know, which invaded and occupied Southeast Asia during World War II. So that's the first tenet. The second tenet is a very strange language in international relations. In fact, it's so unique. The second tenet is that Japan will adopt a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with the ASEAN member states. Uh, in Japanese, it's called Kokoro to Kokoro no Furiai. They have heart to heart relationship, very odd balance in international relations. The third is that Japan will support ASEAN as a regional organization based on an equal partnership. Japan will support ASEAN as a regional organization based on an equal partnership. You see, in 1977, the relations between Japan and ASEAN states were very asymmetrical. Japan was already the world's second largest economic superpower. And uh, ASEAN, the ASEAN states, ASEAN as a regional organization in 1977 was only a decade old, 10 year old. And uh, But relations today is very, very much less asymmetrical. Okay, very, very much less asymmetrical. But it was asymmetrical then, notwithstanding that, uh, Japan already had a vision that this relationship should be based on an equal partnership. It was kind of idealistic. No? The reality was the relationship was asymmetrical, but uh, the the uh, the norm, you know, the idealistic approach is that uh, Japan would treat the ASEAN countries with respect on an equal partnership. I think this is the key reason why the Fukuda Doctrine had been uh, regarded with great appreciation and and uh, you know, embraced by the Southeast Asian countries, this this thing about the heart to heart relationship and the equal partnership. Okay, Thanks. okay. Since nineteen seventy seven, uh, Japan had adopted um a very cooperative and helpful approach to Southeast Asia. It is an important investment and trade trading partner with Southeast Asia. Uh, Japan provided generous ODA, official development assistance, and Japan assisted some of the ASEAN countries reeling from the catastrophic 1997-1998 you know, Asian financial crisis. And very interestingly, um, Japan has consistently engaged in peace building, the consolidation of peace in uh, regional civil wars, consolidation of peace in various Southeast Asian countries like Cambodia, East Timor, uh, Aceh in S Sumatra, Indonesia, uh, Muslim Mindanao in the Southern Philippines, and the ongoing uh, civil war-like conundrum in Myanmar. 
since 2023, Tokyo has provided OSA, official security assistance, to some ASEAN countries. And Japan today is also a staunch supporter of the ASEAN-centric multilateralism in East Asia, such as the ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Plus 3, East Asian Summit, and the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. So all this thing about, you know, talk about ASEAN centrality and so on, it's possible because uh, of friends like Japan, which had supported us from day one, ASEAN multilateralism in East Asia. And um, so the question mark is, we're going to celebrate the... We celebrated the so-called 50th anniversary last year based on the uh, synthetic rubber forum. But as I've said, we should mark the 50th anniversary of the Fukuda Doctrine, which is uh, 2027. So what is the challenge to japan Southeast Asian relations? I think the relationship is so good that there's a tendency for both sides to, to become complacent, to take it for granted. So rather than resting on their laurels on how wonderful this relationship has been, this partnership has been, how can their cooperative relationship move forward in the next few decades? Okay, What should we do together, partnership, to make it real, rather than to pat each other on the back? You know? What can we do to move ahead? Uh, I have a few suggestions and then I'll uh, conclude. Uh, before I conclude, there'll be a short you know, discussion on my part about international law. Okay, so these are these are my suggestions for cooperation. Uh, first, at the principal level, norms, Japan and ASEAN should, in principle, affirm and uphold international law, the freedom of navigation, and no use of force in territorial disputes. So th these are basically fundamental uh fundamental principles of the United Nations system. Uh, second, uh, Japan should con support the ASEAN member states to deal with the civil war-like conundrum in Myanmar. So we really need a support. Because ASEAN by itself cannot solve this very difficult, intractable problem in Myanmar. And Japan, traditionally, today, have very good relationship with Myanmar. Okay, so... Uh, so we can rely on the good offices of Japan to cooperate with ASEAN to help us address the problem in Myanmar. Okay. Third, Japan should cooperate with ASEAN to assist East Timor's accession to become the 11th member state of ASEAN. So right now we have ASEAN 10, and when East Timor joins ASEAN, it'll be ASEAN 11. But East Timor is really, really, uh, uh, you know, uh, a struggling developing country and it will be appreciated if Japan can cooperate with some of the more affluent ASEAN countries to uh, assist East Timor in the training of the officials, the provision of uh, official development assistance and so on. Okay, so beyond functional cooperation such as uh, digital trade pacts, uh, digital trade pacts, digital trade agreements with the ASEAN member states, uh, Japan and Southeast Asia should also cooperate to prevent the extinction of flora and fauna, okay, plants and animals, huh? pollution of the oceans, climate change regionally and globally. Okay, So not everything is about geopolitics and so on. We can cooperate huh? at different levels. Okay, And uh, let me briefly say something about the rule of law. That's the theme of our discussion. Um, at the ideational level, uh, the theoretical level, we know that international order, okay, international order meaning a pattern of predictability, uh, non cohesion the honouring of contracts, and so on, is really based on the combination of formal international law. Is International law is necessary but not sufficient. Okay? It's a combination of formal international law, informal norms, based on shared values, a sense of a community, regional community, and global society global society, you know, uh, and the harsh reality of the balance of power, balance of power, deterrence, and so on, okay? So international law has to be underpinned by power and also uh, notions and feelings of uh, cooperation, okay? Um, Japan and the ASEAN member states are members of the U UN, 
and in principle sub subscribe to international law and global norms of respecting national sovereignty and non-coercive measures in territorial disputes. Okay, so the ASEAN member states comprise small and middle powers which benefit most from international law and the respect of national sovereignty. And they really don't need any external great powers to tell them, hey guys, you know, international law is important for you and it's good for you, you know. So we know, you know, we have problems with each other. We go to the international court of justice instead of fighting each other, okay? That's a case between uh, Singapore and Malaysia, Malaysia and Indonesia, and even between, uh, you know, Thailand and Cambodia, you know, they, they had that problem over fighting over the Via Fibra temple and so on. Huh? But that's the approach of ASEAN states. We go to the International Court of Justice, international law to address uh, certain territorial disputes without going to war. The problem is that superpowers often resort to international law on a very selective basis. So some superpowers would ignore international law when it is inconvenient to them. Okay. Uh, an issue is not whether uh, states in the interna international system sub subscribe to international law in principle. In fact, virtually all states would claim that they are good citizens, they abide by international law. The problem is when an international crisis erupts, states driven by their national interests would take different positions on international law or choose to ignore international law such as the contravention of the fundamental principle of sovereignty. Okay, um, A very painful example is when Russia invaded Ukraine. How did the countries in the international system behave? Okay, ASEAN. Now, what, what was the approach of the ASEAN states? They, they all subscribe to inter international law, but is it lip service? So what were their responses at the United Nations? after Russia invaded Ukraine. You see, in this case, all ASEAN states except Vietnam and Laos voted to support the United Nations General Assembly's resolution condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine and calling for Russian forces to withdraw. Okay? So what did Vietnam and Laos do? Two socialist states. They abstain. Vietnam depends on Russia for its weapon systems. The military junta in Myanmar supports Russia's invasion of Ukraine, just like uh, North Korea. So not with, notwithstanding that ASEAN member states do not necessarily act in unison in international affairs, such as over Russia's invasion of Ukraine or China's excessive nine-dash line claims in the disputed South China Sea, what should we do? ASEAN and Japan should continue to uphold international law. Okay, So, so in principle, uh, ASEAN and Japan would say that we uphold international law, but when push comes to the shaft, you find that uh, out of the 192 flags flying in front of the United Nations, that very often states behave quite differently despite giving lip service to international law. Okay, my conclusion. The relations between post war Japan and Southeast Asia are no longer governed by realist power politics. Of course, you know, Japan, Southeast Asia, we are sensitive to the geostrategic competition between the two superpowers, the United States and China. We are sensitive to various flashpoints in uh, East Asia, like the disputed South China Sea, East China Sea, Senkaku, um, North Korean uh, nuclearization, cross-strait tension between mainland China and Taiwan. Okay, so so this this is a reality which we cannot wish away. But between Japan and South Asia, our relations are not governed by militaristic realist power politics. And I would argue between Tokyo and Southeast Asia, and there's a sense of community based on the idealistic heart-to-heart -heart relationship. So uh, I may be subverting uh, <laughs> the theme of this uh, webinar, which is uh, international law, Japan, and Southeast Asia. Uh, I, I would say that you know the relations between Japan and Southeast Asia is really not governed by international law, you know, but it's more on this ideational heart to heart relationship the cynics may say it's a uh, wallet to wallet you know is this economics but but it, but both sides 
had clung on to this uh, heart to heart relationship, you know. And uh, when we approach the 50th anniversary of the Fukuda Doctrine 2027, you will hear a lot of people articulating heart to heart relationship, which there's no heart to heart relationship between Korean Peninsula and Japan or between China and and uh, Japan. So maybe that's a problem in Northeast Asian geopolitics. Right? There's no heart-to-heart -heart relationship. So uh, I will conclude by saying that this ASEAN-Japan partnership is a time-tested friendship. Time-tested. And we should look forward to the Golden Jubilee of the Fukuda Doctrine in 2027 and uh, continue. It's, it's a work half done. It's a work in progress. A work in progress. We have done very well for the past 50 years. But what should we do for the next 50 years? So we should explore how Japan and ASEAN can deepen and broaden their comprehensive friendship and cooperation, not just for our own narrow self-interest, but also to add value to the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, a, a great introduction. And I, and I think that's exactly it when we talk about the rule of law uh, and how it shapes the relationship between ASEAN states and ASEAN and, and Japan. It, it's not just about what goes on between ASEAN and Japan. It's also how that shapes the rest of the world, how that, uh, you know, um, kind of puts that that relationship in context. Um, so that's wonderful. And you, and you mentioned, you know, the, the beginning of this relationship as being asymmetrical, I think in the early 1970s, uh, when the, you know, the beginning of this 50 year period started, that was just when Japan was exporting 1 million cars and surprising the world and making kind of changing people's minds about the extent and the sophistication of Japan's economic mir miracle. Now it's Thailand at 1 million cars. I think in 2022, it hit that mark and changing people's ideas about the, you know, the, the economies of, of Southeast Asia. Uh, so, I mean, a very, you know, very good overview, very, very relevant. And I'm, and I'm very happy to say also that uh, Kavi Chidogong, uh, um, Chunky Devorn has overcome his technical issues and has joined us. So I'll give well, him a formal well, yeah, welcome. I'll give you your formal introduction before I turn over the uh, the the baton. Uh, Mr. Chunky Devorn is a veteran journalist and a newspaper editor. He's currently a senior fellow at Chulalongkorn University in Thailand. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'll turn it over to you now uh, to give your opening remarks, and then I'll I'll follow up with a few questions for both of you. Well, thank you very much, uh, J Jonathan. I have, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I have listened uh, attentively to my good friend, Lam Pang -a. He is the Wikipedia of uh, ASEAN-Japan relation. He have touched on every important point since 1973 up to now. So he left me no room to elaborate. I was fortunate enough to twist my PowerPoint by relying on heart to heart. Uh, can you move into my, uh, my, 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 my first slides? Um, before I start my, my, my presentation, I have three words, three things I want to say about uh, Japan and ASEAN, which I think has been touched here and there by Lam Pang Er. First, Japan is most trusted uh, partner of ASEAN. If you check all the survey, uh, within uh, Asia, um, in Singapore, in Indonesia, you will see that uh, Japan is a trust, uh, number one trusted partner of ASEAN. Secondly, Japan, as Rampang -er said, that treat ASEAN as an equal partner. That's very important because of the nature of the uh, asymmetric uh, relation. I think that is number two. Number number three. This is a very uniqueness that explains uh, ASEAN-Japan relation that is they co-create solutions and cooperation. These are the three important features of uh, ASEAN-Japan relation that explain the whole, uh, uh, what I would say, a kaleidoscope of uh, ASEAN-Japan relation on the eve of uh, uh, 50th anniversary. I agree with Ram Bang uh, that uh, he said that uh, 1973 synthetic rubber should not count as the beginning. But I would argue that given the good nature 
of ASEAN-Japan relation that would like to help everything engagement between Japan and Southeast Asia then as ASEAN. That is why you have uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, uh, relation. So what I try to say is that Japan all along have earned this trust. Japan has to earn it. You mentioned all right, so during Tanaka-san, very anti uh, uh, Japan, very uh, strong. You know, I was I was raised during the time. I even protest uh, in front of uh, Daimaru uh, department store. We watched the first uh, department store uh, in Thailand. Now you don't have to mention it. You know, uh, Japanese things, uh, almost everything, food, fashion. Uh, everything uh, has become uh, what I would say, Thai and I, say our minds. So I like to move forward to the present time. I, I like to uh, categorize my my argument of Japan ASEAN relation, uh, which Lampanga said heart to heart. But heart to heart has continue to be the foundation of ASEAN-Japan relation. But relation move on. I think um, relation between Japan and ASEAN has involved uh, economic and development cooperation a lot during to the unifications of uh, Indochina uh, and also integrated uh, with ASEAN after the end of uh, Second Indochina War. I think, um, that I would characterize is a hand to hand. Japan worked very hard to raise the uh, standard of living of Indochina. A lot of people have not give uh, due credits to, uh, to, uh, to Japan. Japan really has done a lot in, in this manner. And that has made uh, integration uh, when Vietnam joined ASEAN in 1995, followed by the rest of uh, Former Indo Chinese state. So I think uh, a lot of credit should be given to that uh, Japan effort. But that kind of relation from heart to heart, uh, hand to hands, I think uh, since uh, 2017, it has become more of the strategic nature. That is why I, I argue that it's a head to head because you have to. Think a little bit more. In the past, you know, Abraham Pang uh, said, you know, maybe it's the financial thing that uh, really Japan rolled out to help Southeast Asia. Now it's no longer uh, that way. Japan has been more strategic. As you can see, uh, Japan start the official security assistant. Japan held after the failures of the CPTPP, uh, 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 TPP to come up with a new uh, uh, free trade agreement that will uh, encompass this part of the world to ensure that multilateral trade continue. And uh, I must say that uh, now that it's out in the open, Japan has been very uh, important driving force in helping uh, the setup of IPEF, IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic uh, uh, Framework without Japan. I don't think, I'm sorry to say, Southeast Asian, uh, seven of them would not join because America, when they start out, only a few countries was in the mind of the White House. There is no such a comprehensive uh, thinking about Southeast Asia. That is what uh, I think uh, uh, Japan's uh, great uh, uh, contribution is that Japan has helped uh, Southeast Asia much closer to America indirectly. A lot of time, um, uh, United States or Western power has uh, misinterpretation or misunderstanding of Southeast Asia. Japan actually would be the one who has helped to uh, correct it. You know, earlier years, especially on the security, for example, it was uh, Japanese idea in the early days to come up with ASEAN Regional Forum. And I think just like uh, Rampang uh, said, a lot of uh, the past people tend to forget uh, uh, what Japan has done. So I think now uh, relation, uh, 
Japan and uh, ASEAN is very comprehensive. That is why uh, last year Japan become a comprehensive strategic partner and Japan correctly came out with, I have read uh, the plan of action. Every uh, comprehensive strategic partner have to come up with an action plan that they have to follow to justify this status. And Japan has altogether, I think, uh, I think 99 uh, action plan. That's a lot. That That's a lot. Uh, Australia also have, Australia come out with 70, uh, something like that. So overall, I, I think now you have heart to heart, that is the foundation. You have hand to hand, that is strongly development in nature and head to head, that is more strategic. So I like to look into my second life, which uh, Rampal Earth uh, did touch upon that next year, uh, uh, in the next uh, look at the future, uh, Golden Jubilee, uh, he said, uh, he mentioned about heart to heart, uh, it should be uh, counting that. But for me, the next 50 year will be crucial. And uh, can you move to second slide, please? My second slide. Ah, yes, I, I, th I think um, ASEAN Japan relation will not change, it will get stronger because uh, we share many commonalities. Uh, number one, it will remain the most trusted partner of ASEAN. And I think um, I have gone through the vision statement and the framework comprehensive economic partnership. You know, it takes almost one year to agree on wording. I have seen the draft. It's not easy, even the wording, even Japan and ASEAN know each other, co-create solution, they still, want to make sure that they understand each other's intention. So I can guarantee that. I think uh, I, can re I can reassure to Rampang uh, that I have um, seen the uh, draft over the past year that they work very hard in order to come up with the final uh, action plan. So I think the, the area, I, as I've already mentioned, you know, it will be on the green economy, sustainable development, climate change, digital transformation, and cybersecurity. There are a lot more, which I think uh, uh, Japan has been focused. Uh, for me, I, I, I love Midori uh, cooperation plan, okay? Personally, I think it's for Gen Z, it's, it's for the future. I think Japan uh, needs something like that. Other thing is has been uh, uh, well covered. So in the future, I think you will see more strategic dialogue cooperation between Japan and individual ASEAN member. I think that that's important Japan uh, has done that. And Japan is the only uh, dialogue partner that put a lot of focus on the promoting capacity building among young ASEAN officer working in the ASEAN headquarter. I use the new name. It's no longer ASEAN Secretariat. It was agreed in the last summit. So um, these are the things that I think uh, we'll make sure that uh, Japan, ASEAN in the next 50 years will be uh, Gordon's uh, decade. And finally, uh, I think um, uh, Japan um, would have to be more innovative in further promote people to people exchange. Uh, Japan already has been very smart, you know, in come out with a lot of things related to culture, uh, try to uh, catching the new trends like Japan pools and uh, uh, cross dressing uh, and uh, anime. But I think there will be a lot more in the future. Now, one more point before I end, I, I don't want to take much time. I think um, Japan and ASEAN has done a great job in uh, op operationalize the uh, Indo-Pacific framework. Japan is the first country to agree uh, with ASEAN on AOIP, that was a very good move. And uh, uh, already, I think uh, both countries have set a very good example to start on common projects. You know, you have four areas and I think Japan has already identified a lot of projects. That is very important because now Australia, America, uh, even China, uh, even though they do not use the word Indo-Pacific, but they also airlines uh, the uh, separate framework so that they can uh, work together with ASEAN. And that is a very uh, important. Uh, Rampang Er has uh, 
explain on the rule of law and the respect uh, whatever norms. I think ASEAN and Japan uh, will use AOIP and Japan Free and Indo-Pacific as the main instrument to enforce, to implement rule-based uh, principle to make sure that inclusive, to make sure that is uh, transparent, that we all respect sovereignty and international law. That's it. Uh, I would end here. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. You know, you mentioned how Japan has served as a bridge in a, of sorts between uh, ASEAN member states and ASEAN and the United States. Uh, and that is quite fascinating because geopolitically, of course, the Japan-ASEAN relationship is increasingly set ag against this background of U.S.-China competition, right, uh, in the region and more broadly. And so I, one, my first question that I'd like to put to uh, both of you, in fact, and maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Lam, since uh, you've been sitting quietly for a little while, uh, is, you know, what role do you see the Japan-ASEAN relationship playing within that framework of growing U.S.-China competition, either within it or maybe in some ways as an alternative to it? Yeah, there are at least uh, two views, uh, two plausible answers to your question. Uh, one one approach, and this this is uh, approach favored by some uh, Japanese analysts, is that uh, even though uh, most of the ASEAN countries are not formal uh, security partners of the United States, you know, with the exception of uh, the Philippines and and Thailand, uh, most of the ASEAN countries are not formal allies of the United States. Uh, many Japanese analysts hope that ASEAN and Japan can make common cause with the United States and its allies to push back against rising Chinese uh, assertiveness. So th th this is a very geopolitical approach. You know? uh, but the reality is that some of the uh, ASEAN countries um, are very hesitant to align itself with any particular superpower because that will incur the wrath you know of the the other great power you know so if you tilt too much uh, too close to china then it may uh trigger you know criticisms and uh, pushback from the united states and its allies if you tilt too much to the us and then that will uh, possibly enrage uh, beijing so so for the first approach uh, hoping to nudge the ASEAN states to align with Japan, the US, and its allies like uh, Australia against uh, China. Um, you know that, that that that's a strategic strategy. That, that's a that's a strategy. But most ASEAN countries will not uh, like to walk down that path, no? because that that is a, a very risky risky path. You don't want to be caught in a crossfire of two superpowers. Now, the, the other approach is uh, while cognizant of uh, the reality of great power rivalry and competition, um, Japan and ASEAN relations should improve on its own merit. Improve each other's relations on its own merit. In, in other words, if Japan and Southeast Asia were to improve their relations, it's not in the, not for the purpose of aligning with each other against a third party. You know that that's a difference for China. Sorry, and let me say that again. That's that's a difference between oh Japan and ASEAN aligning with each other against China. Okay, and another approach is that regardless of whether the superpower relations between China and, and uh, Un United States, whether their relations are up or down, Japan and Southeast Asia should continue to reinforce their relationship comprehensively. Okay, so whether the US and uh, Chinese relations have been good, which had been uh, been the case in, in the past, you know, 
Japan and Singapore uh, and uh, Southeast Asia did improve their relations. Uh, just for the historical context in the 20th century, the US and China were aligned against Japan during the Second World War, right? And during the second half of the, of the Cold War, there was a united front between China, the United States, and some of the ASEAN countries against the Soviet Union, uh, Eastern Bloc, and Vietnam, because Vietnam invaded Cambodia. So what, what I'm saying is that uh, the preferred approach by many ASEAN countries is that regardless of the tension between the United States and China, even though Japan is a formal ally of the United States, Southeast Asia will seek to improve its relations with Japan and Southeast Asia hopes that Japan will value the relationship with Southeast Asia on its own merit, for its own sake, not because the Southeast Asian countries can be useful allies or pawns in some greater geopolitical struggle, some kind of a Darwinian, you know, a Hobbesian world, you know. So these are the two, approach, two approaches. You know, I'm kind of simplifying things, but uh, yeah. two approaches. Long-winded answer to your question. That's a great answer. I mean, certainly, certainly the impression one gets from here. I mean, I'm a Canadian sitting in Japan, uh, but uh, you know, if if there's one thing that a diverse region like Southeast Asia seems to have in common is is a persistent, you know, desire not to be pawns in in this game while still kind of navigating it. Yeah, um, and and if anything, I mean, the, the theme is the rule of law. I mean, the the emphasis on the rule of law, I think, you know, almost feels like. It's a denominator that we that uh, countries can get behind, which doesn't maybe smack too much of of uh, you know other terms that might seem confrontational to to China. But uh, um, Mr. Chung Kitamo, I'd like to get your uh, your take on the sa on the same question: the relationship in the context of U.S. China competition. Okay, I, I have a simple answer and very short one. Japan okay. wants to make sure that United States continue engagement in Southeast Asia. So Japan will do everything, everything, I mean everything to ensure that U.S. will not abandon because U.S. has a, his, has a long history of unreliability unreli because, you know, they come in and go, they increase their rebalance and then they, they track off. So uh, Japan uh, view this kind of uh, U.S. Uh, autopilot or that kind of uh, behavior very unhealthy for the stability in the region. So they want to, Japan want to create, help create framework that United States can engage with Southeast Asia in a healthy way. And I think Japan has done that with the uh, IPEF, that, that's for sure, and uh, ASEAN Regional uh, Forum. So that will be my, 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 my answer. Right. So, I mean, yeah, Japan, and, I mean, no, please go ahead. I lo would love to have you react. And Jonathan, yeah, with your permission, I would like to piggyback on uh, Kavi to piggyback support away. what Kavi said. No? You look at the United States, what happened in 1975? I, I remember, you know, the Americans were fleeing on the last helicopter from, from the top of the embassy in Saigon, and now it's called Ho Chi Minh City, right? They, 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 just, uh, they just abandoned uh, South Vietnam. Right, they have half a million troops, but they abandoned South Vietnam. Um, so I remember in 1975, the Southeast Asian countries, the ASEAN countries were very shocked. You know, in 1975, ASEAN was just eight years old. <laughs> it was established <laughs> in 1967, and the Americans, the greatest superpower, right? That was the Soviet Union superpower, just left. And that was a strategic vacuum, you know, 1975. And uh, that is one reason why... Japan did a self-help, you know, with the Fukuda doctrine. There was strategic vacuum. It, you know, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. If there's a vacuum, nobody feels it. It will be filled somehow, sometime, somewhere. You know, there's there's no such thing as a vacuum, geopolitical vacuum in Southeast Asia. So Fukuda doctrine was uh, an attempt by Japan to pick up the pieces to fill in the vacuum. Uh, resulted from the U.S dishonorable exit from Indochina, okay? But then Biden administration, what, what happened in Afghanistan? You know, it was, it, was, it was such a disorganized exit 
it was a humiliating, disastrous exit from Afghanistan. The U.S. were involved in Afghanistan, Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan. So, so what is the message? What, what is the takeaway? The U.S. can be there, war on terror or domino theory, war on communism in China, but boom, disappear. Yes. So where where will that leave Southeast Asia? <laughs> right, they may they talk about rebalancing, pivoting, Indo China Pacific, in in Indo uh Pacific concept, and 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 uh, Trump. What what if Trump is back? I think there's a very good like likelihood that he may win his reelection. Okay, if you put a gun against my head and say, hey, give me your last yen, you know, make a bet. Biden Trump, I, I say very good chance. I'll, I'll bet on Trump. He's back. Not necessarily because I like him, but that's the nature of the domestic domestic politics of the United States. Very polarized, right? So if Trump were to say, America first. Okay, America first. Reasonable, right? Because I can also say Singapore first. My Japanese friends can say Japan first. But what, is, what does American entails? Okay, so is Trump going to accept the annexation of uh, Crimea by the Soviet Union? Uh, sorry, by, by Russia? Okay, or parts of Donbass by uh, Russia. But if the Trump administration were to accept the line of control, effective line, de facto line of control, what's the implications for Taiwan or for other disputed areas in East Asia, including Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia? So I think Kavi really raised, <laughs> raised a sensitive but necessary point. And uh, if the United States is unpredictable, I think Japan has been quite predictable to the Southeast Asian yeah, countries. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Japan, Australia, and other countries really have to avoid a strategic vacuum in East Asia. Yes, and perhaps yeah, the, kind of, the extending of some of these, uh, you know, networks of relationships beyond the kind of traditional American hub and spoke to bringing in Australia, bringing in, you know, new institutions like the Quad is, is part of that, you know, hedging, if you like. We have a question from the audience now, uh, and we have about just under 15 minutes left, so I want to shift to that, if that's okay. Uh, I think both of you can see it on your screen, but I'm going to read it anyway. It says, thank you for, this is from uh, Julia Maggiano. It says, thank you for the interesting presentations. Question is, regarding China's territorial claims in the South China Sea, how might Japan act to ensure regional stability in the event of a military escalation of disputes between China and ASEAN nations? What's Japan? What do you think Japan's approach to the issue might be? Um, maybe this time, just to mix up the order, uh, Mr. Chunk, Devon, we'll start with you. Okay. Well, thank you. This is a very good question. I think the role of Japan has been uh, mainly uh, diplomatic and also the manifestation that you one has to respect uh, international law. So far, Japan has been very good in promoting uh, ASEAN solidarities that, you know, uh, regarding the rule base, uh, Japan is for one who strongly support. As you uh, have mentioned, um, Japan has all along through it, the Ukraine-Russia war has been traveling uh, the world in Southeast Asia and mentioned the uh, uh, importance of not changing the international status of what is going on. So I think that's Japan would do. Uh, mainly, that's the most important contribution uh, in case of Japan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, this disputed South China Sea issue, the spreadlies and so on, it's something uh, very tricky and awkward for Japan. Okay, So presently, you want, what is the Japanese approach? Okay, uh, First, Japan had, uh, had, had formulated a new uh, legal framework, a new policy, official security assistance. So, uh, so instead of providing... Uh, security assistance under the old Official Development Assistance Framework, ODA, it has now a distinct official security assistance, you know, the provision of uh, radar system to the Philippines, Coast Guard training for some of the Southeast Asian states, um, the gift of uh, petrol boats to some of the Southeast Asian uh, Cayman states. But, I mean, let's let's be frank. Uh, on uh, if we to speak honestly to each other, will that deter China, the PLA Navy, 
just because Japan provides some radar system, Coast Guard training, patrol boats. I, I, I don't really think so. Uh, Japan has uh, regular exercises in the South China Sea okay, with uh, the United States, but Japan never committed itself to join patrols with the United States in the South China Sea because that's very risky. And uh, Japan has uh, legislation, um, 1997 U.S.-Japan Defense Guidelines, guidelines, you know, uh, that Japan will provide logistical support, logistical support to U.S. forces in situations in the vicinity of Japan if it's a threat to uh, Japan. Okay, that, it, that sounds very convol convoluted, right? I mean, in situations in the vicinity of Japan, it poses a threat to Japan. So it had been interpreted as uh, something which happens in the Korean Peninsula and in Taiwan. But the US-Japan defense guidelines have never really been like officially articulated to include the South China Sea. South China Sea is uh, rather big, huh? including the... China self de declared nine dash line. Now it's ten dash line. Um, very interestingly, uh, Japan and the Philippines have uh, forged a recent agreement for mutual access for their for their military. So, uh, Japanese military, uh, Filipino military, in principle, can uh, make use of each other facility, some kind of reciprocal exchange. The self-defense force can, uh, from the little I know, can have access to uh, facilities, access to facilities in the Philippines. So uh, that said, what I've said about the provision of uh, aid and uh, access to, to facilities and, and also uh, uh, military exercises in the Philippines and so on, uh, Balikatan, shoulder to shoulder, military exercises. I, I don't think Japan is obliged to intervene in the South China Sea. It's very big. Japan may not necessarily have the ability to project power, offensive power to the South China Sea. The bottom line, I think the critical thing remains the United States. Whether the United States is able and willing to engage in a balance of power in the South China Sea, deterrence. And of course, Japan plays a very critical role to provide uh, military bases, facilities in Okinawa, which enables the United States to perform that role. But whether Japan would actually be willing to engage in an armed conflict with China over some disputed islands, uh, that I have uh, a big question mark. A big question. And there's also a question mark about because uh, is that a point interest for China? Even, yeah. even want that, I would argue, right? I mean, because again, yeah. I think a big uh, not on, not only does do sell is you know ASEAN member states have very different you know divergent views on on the China relationship. Again, I don't think anyone wants uh, you know uh, an, an escalate an escalation, right? So, all right, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think, uh, you know, we don't have any, I, I would invite uh, people watching online to submit uh, one or two more questions, uh, if you don't mind. In the meantime, uh, I will ask uh, a follow-up that basically uh, talks a little bit about the concept of this free and open Indo-Pacific, which is uh, kind of emerged from Japan, has been embraced by the United States, uh, Australia, a few other countries, um, and to a lesser or greater extent, also within uh, ASEAN and ASEAN member states has become a kind of a touch, touchstone. But of course, there are definitely some shades of enthusiasm there. And not every country in the region is, uh, has kind of signed on to that. I think, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses, do you think, of this concept? And, and what, what is it going to take? Uh, what would it take to get a kind of more uh, full-throated endorsements and participation in this idea from uh, either ASEAN, I mean, or, or uh, sort of the more reluctant member states within within ASEAN. Um, maybe, uh, maybe, um, Mr. Chong Kitavon, you could. Uh... 
Okay. Can you give us uh, your view on that first before I turn back to Dr. Lam? Yes. Uh, for for the free open uh, Indo-Pacific to work, you you need a partner, you need champions to work in certain area. You know, all four of the five area. Japan can be a champion in maritime cooperation to make sure that, you know, uh, uh, as the Rampang uh, uh, suggests on the environment, there are many other areas. The problems, uh, I, I, I want to point out that uh, AOIP initially, uh, some ASEAN country um, were reluctant. Now they all supported. Otherwise, uh, it would not come out in 2019. Remember when the idea was earlier raised, it was killed. It was killed. It was revised uh, later by Indonesia and Thailand because at first they thought that if ASEAN come out with their own Indo-Pacific, it will discourage America to engage with the region. This was the reason. But of course, Japan, uh, when Japan come out with AOIP, we thought that it's too Western. Japan has to change and change, refine and refine seven times, if I count it right, and change it. At first, there's no ASEAN in the earlier draft. And then Japan realized that is what uh, great about Japan. Japan later realized that if you want to be trusted partner, you have to co-create. You have to work together, consult together, especially on the security. Because Japan and ASEAN, if they cooperate on the issue, on strategy, they don't want to sort of go to a third party. ASEAN would not, would not do that. So I think in the Pacific case, there are a lot of uh, a good uh, area among the priority, uh, maritime cooperation, sustainability, which Japan has uh, outlined in full length in the plan of action. So there are a lot of room. So first you have to get out the, some of the important dialogue partner in. I think Japan already in and Korea this year will be comprehensive strategic partner will come in and will compete because they also have a very good uh, action plan. So I think uh, ASEAN uh, way is to make sure that you streamline, you take all the best and find the common uh, uh, area that uh, you can uh, rely on from each uh, dialogue partner. Thank you. Thank you. All right, D Dr. Lam, for you, what's it going to take to either more deeply establish it or, or or adjust it to make it, uh, you know, a real co lasting cornerstone for the rule of law in the region? Yeah, yeah. May, may I address the uh, first question about the Indo-Pacific concept? Yeah. Um, yes, with the caveat, very interestingly, we, only have, we only have two more minutes. <laughs> yeah, very, very, okay, very, very quickly. Uh, J Japan, uh, Abe administration articulated the concept and it had been embraced by the United States, Australia and some other countries. Um, my clarification would be that ASEAN states have an outlook, outlook towards the Indo-Pacific. That means that some of the ASEAN states do not necessarily embrace it as their strategic concept, strategic approach. Like Singapore, we still talk about the uh, Asia Pacific, but not Indo Pacific. You know, we have an outlook towards the Indo Pacific, but what is the outlook to Indo Pacific? It's basically a reaffirmation of ASEAN centrality. So, for the ASEAN countries, Indo Pacific concept must not come at the expense of ASEAN centrality. Because of time limitation, my second and last comment will be let's question mark about Indonesia, uh, India's. Uh, reliability as a partner in the Indo-Pacific uh, concept because India's strategic focus is basically primarily towards Pakistan. Yes, it has not forgotten its uh, defeat in 1962. Uh, but India has, has also very close relations with Russia. Yeah, Russia has reinforced its relations with China India is dependent on, to a very large extent on Russian weapons. And, and India had been very mahal and very meek towards the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. So basically, we Southeast Asia, we don't really expect um, a very strong Indian commitment 
to the South China Sea or East China Sea or the Korean Peninsula and so on. So to a certain, certain extent, I would argue that we should not be too romantic about the Indo-Pacific concept because can this bird fly? You know? That's one gigantic wing you know, with uh, US, Japan and so on. Then a little wing, a little crippled wing from India, which had been very soft on Russia. Okay, can this bird fly? Yeah, I'll end because of time okay. limitation. <laughs> We've just we've just hit time, but right under the wire, someone stuck in a question about Myanmar, and I I do like to reward people who ask questions. Uh, if uh, as you can see, it's you know uh, how can ASEAN and Japan cooperate to uh, solve the question of Myanmar? I don't think we're going to solve the question of Myanmar in the two minutes that I'm willing to go over time. But if either of you have a maybe one minute uh, answer to the question of of uh, how. Uh, how Japan and, and ASEAN can engage, can or should engage in Myanmar. I'd love to hear it. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Chung. Well, well the, Japan has already a mm. uh, very close uh, contact uh, with uh, military regime to uh, its uh, informal 1.5 track two. And Japan can play two, two roles because Japan is very good in providing uh, assistance both development assistant and in the future, in the next maybe few months from now, humanitarian uh, uh, assistant. And then later on, Japan would uh, cooperate with other, including specialized UN agency uh, to mobilize because uh, what is needed to build democracy back to Myanmar people, you need a lot of help from other country. And also within Myanmar, you have uh, internal problems, war amongst the uh, ethnic arm group with the central government and all that, that has to be settled before a lot of things, before ASEAN can really uh, fully implement five-point uh, peace consensus. At the moment, I think there is the progress only on the number four, that is on humanitarian assistance, which is still uh, pretty uh, marginal. So you're thinking Japan can sort of, as from an outside perspective, pave the way uh, for implementation of the five-point oh, consensus? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Japan I, has uh, I think we could, we could, this is an, another topic we could do a whole other other hour on, but I'm gonna have to cut it off here. Uh, I want to thank both of our guests uh, profusely for joining us. Uh, also thank our audience. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope everyone good. else yeah. did too. Uh, and uh, hope you'll join us on future sessions. So thank you very much. We're going to close the session here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.